Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about combining functions, section 2.8 in our book. The first problem, they want us to find f plus g, f minus g, f times g, and then f divided by g, and then also the domains. So they've given us our two functions, and basically we're just going to do these four operations to these two functions. So the first, the first operation being f plus g. So all that means is I get square root 1 plus x squared plus square root 1 minus x. So I can't really simplify it any further than that, but what I need to do here now is find their domains. So let's look at f first. So f, right, The really the only thing we would be looking for uh, in f is to see if we get a negative under the radical. But since our x term is squared, no matter, no matter what number I plug in for x, since I'm squaring it, I'm going to get a positive number back. So there's no way to get a negative number under the radical for my f of x function. So the domain of f, if you want to do it that way, is going to be all real numbers. And remember, we're going to use interval notation. G of x, however, there, it is possible to have a negative under the radical. So if you want to do maybe domain of g, something like that. If I plug a 1 in, I'm good. Because 1 minus 1 is 0, I can take the square root of 0. But for instance, if I plug a 2 in, right, 1 minus 2 would be negative 1. I can't take the square root of negative 1. So that means my domain... Right? And I, if I plugged a 0 in, I'd be fine. 1 minus 0 is 1. If I plugged a negative 1 in, I'd get 1 minus negative 1, so I'd get a positive 2. So square root of positive 2 gives us a real number. So 1 is the largest number I can plug into my g of x and still have a real number. And then any negative number I plug in will work. Also, you'll see that I have bracketed the 1 because I can include the 1. If I plug the 1 in, I just get a 0, and I'm allowed to take the square root of 0. It's just 0. So when I have composition of functions, I have to take into account both parts, domains. So the overall domain of f plus g is going to be the most limited domain. Right? I cannot plug 2, even though 2 works for my, g, or for my f, 2 does not work for my g, so I have to use the most limited domain when I'm talking about composition of functions. So my domain of f plus g, maybe even, is going to be negative infinity. Any negative number works, but I can only go up to 1. Because 1 is the limiting factor in my g of x. Okay, so that's f plus g. Let's go to f minus g. So I get square root 1, 1, maybe, 1 plus x squared minus square root 1 minus x. Well, again, I can't combine these. So I, I have got the same domains, right? Nothing changed other than the minus, but that's not going to change anything underneath my radical. So again, my domain of f minus g is going to be negative infinity to 1. Third one they wanted us to do was f times g. So that's going to be square root 1 plus x squared times square root 1 minus x. Now I can combine this. When I'm multiplying radicals like this, I can multiply everything inside and then put it all under the radical. So that gives me 1 plus x squared, 1 minus x. Okay, 1 plus x squared, if I were to factor that, has no real roots, right? So there's no limiting factors there. Only limiting factor here being if I plug anything greater than um, 1, 
into my function, I'm going to get a negative number. Negative times, obviously, any positive number is going to give us a negative under the radical. So even though this looks much different, it's going to keep the same domain because I cannot plug a negative value in for that x because then it'll still give me a negative number under my radical, which will give us an undefined function. So again, the domain of f times g stays negative infinity 1. And I'm allowed to have a 0 under here, that's fine. 0 times 0 gives us, or 0 times any number here, that would actually be 2, gives us a 0, square is 0, 0, it's a real number we could. Last one, f divided by g, so that gives me square root 1 plus x squared divided by square root 1 minus x. Well now I have a slightly different problem. We still agree, right, that I cannot have a negative number uh, under the radical. But now I can also not have 0 under the radical. So that means I can't plug the number 1 in because 1 minus 1 would be 0, square root of 0 is 0, and it give me a 0 in the denominator. So I can't use the number 1, and I also cannot have anything less than, or I also um, cannot have anything greater than 1. So that means my domain now um, cannot include 1. And anything less than 1 is still good. So the domain changes just slightly. And negative infinity still works. Any negative number is going to work because that's going to give me a positive value over there. Just now I can't include 1 because if I put 1 in there, uh, I get a 0 in the denominator and I can't divide by 0. So it changes slightly. All negative numbers and every number positive up until 1, but now I cannot include 1 to give me a 0 in the denominator. All right. Let's move on to the next problem. Okay, again, they've given us two functions, f of x, g of x. They ask us to evaluate this expression. So when they say f composed with g, all they really mean is f of g. And in this case, they want you to plug negative 2 into your g function. So when they're saying f composed with g, really what they want you to do is take the negative 2, plug it into your g function, right? We're, we're very familiar with this. And then whenever, whatever answer you get from there, you also plug it into your f function. So first thing I'll do, f of, and I'm going to take this negative 2, I'm going to plug it into my g function. So instead of g of negative 2, I'm going to take negative 2 and plug it in wherever I see an x over here. And remember, whenever I plug that number in, I'm going to keep it in parentheses just to make sure we don't screw up any negatives. So I still got f of, well, 2 minus negative 2 squared. That's going to be 2 minus 4. So that means I take f of negative 2. And f of negative 2 just means now I take a negative 2 and plug it into my f function. So that's going to be equal to 3 times negative 2 minus 5, which equals negative 6 minus 5, which should give me negative 11. So that is f of g of negative 2. So I've just taken negative 2, plugged it into g, then whatever answer I get, I plug that into f. Just so happens that g of negative 2 came up with negative 2. That's not going to happen every time. The second problem asks me to do g of f of negative 2. So, very similar. Okay, I take f of negative 2 first, so I'm going to keep this g on the outside. So I plug negative 2 in for f, so I get 3 times negative 2 minus 5. Okay, so I still have my g of 3 times negative 2 is negative 6 minus 5. So I get g of negative 11. So now I just take that negative 11 and I plug it into g wherever I see an x. So that gives me 2 minus negative 11 squared which is 2 minus, well, negative 11 squared is 121. So 2 minus 121 is a negative 
119. So f of g of negative 2 gives me negative 11 as an answer, where g of f of negative 2 gives me 119. So that's the basics of combining functions. We've combined f and g, right, and we're just evaluating it at some point, and they'll tell you which point. Now we're doing three functions. We're combining three functions. And here they're not asking you to evaluate at any specific point. They're just saying at x, at the general term x. So I'm going to rewrite this because I like to rewrite it. f of g of h and f of g of h. And they don't give us a value, so it's just h of x. So we're just doing the same thing we just did in the previous one, but we've got three functions to work with. So I'm going to leave my f out here. g of h just means I take h and I plug it in wherever I see an x in g. So g only has this one term, x cubed. So that means I take x squared plus 1, or I'm sorry, plus 2, and it's cubed. That is g of h. So I've just taken h plugged it into g wherever I see an x, in this case only one x. So now I've got f of g of h right here. Then I just take this term and plug it into my f function. So that means I get 1 over x squared plus 2 cubed. I just took 1 over whatever I had in for g. Right, so it's basically just 1 over whatever's in for g. So my final answer should be f of g of h of x just equals that fraction. We can't go any further. We don't know what x equals. But we've combined these three functions into one. Last problem. They've given us the three functions combined. Right? They're basically telling us this is f of g of h of x. We have to now figure out what f equals, what g equals, and what h equals. Right? So similar to here, we're going to figure out these three parts given the answer. So the first thing I can see from here is my f function, my outside function, must be equal to 2 over x. Right? I've got a 2 on the top, that's not going to change. And this bottom term is what I've plugged into f. So the whole term we can see is just 2 over some value x. So I can see the outside function must be 2 over x. Now let's break into this bottom function. So that must mean that g equals 3 plus some number x, and I failed to say that 2 over x, this x value here, if I want to think of this whole term as x, must be squared, right? Because we've got a squared term here. So f must be 2 over x squared. Then that means g is 3 plus x. I just take that 3 plus x, plug it into x squared. We can see that we're getting back to our original. And then h must just be square root of x. So this is my f, g, h. I've got it in the form f, g, h, just like they gave us in the previous example. And I can see that if I plug, um, let's just work backwards to show that this works. So f of g of h of x. So remember, I just take f of the inside g of x g of h of x. So if I plug h into g, I get 3 plus square root x. Now I have to take f of that. Well, f says whatever x is, take 2 over it and square it. So that just equals 2 over 3 plus square root x squared. And that gets us back to our original function, our original composition function.
Okay, so go ahead and try the examples on the PowerPoint, and we'll talk about this tomorrow in class.